Thank you for joining everyone on this family day. I don't know if it's family day all across Canada or if that's just an Ontario thing, but here in Ontario, it is family day. Um, so we're joining with our democratic family, um, our family of, of people who believe in making the world a better place by um, evaluating and perhaps reforming the principles and structures upon which our democracy is based. Uh, this is part of a movement, uh, sorry, this is part of a speaker series called Voices from the Movement. I think this is episode four or five. Um, these have been really, really fun. They happen every, roughly every second Monday. And we do post these on YouTube afterwards. Our guest tonight is Peter McLeod. He's the principal and a co-founder of Mass LBP. I'm really, 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 really excited about this one. And feel free to throw your questions or comments into the chat. Um, Kevin, you're going to let people in as we as we as we go on because my 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 mind's going to wander away from the chat. Um, we have a few of Peter's colleagues here who might chime in as well. And I want to thank all of you for taking your time to join us. My name is Dave. I'm the creative director of Unlock Democracy Canada. We are a national nonprofit that is um, looking at ways to improve um, the operating system of Canada's democracy. We believe that it could feel and look um, and sound so much better than what we have right now. Um, we think that our current democratic landscape is a shadow of what's possible. Um, and Peter McLeod and his, his firm, Mass LBP, has really proven our thesis more than anyone. Um, if you believe in democracy, it means you believe in people, right? I mean, it's a, it, is a de it is the most decentralized form of power sharing. And if you, if you believe in democracy and don't believe in people, then um, that's kind of weird. Yet so many of us deep down do have doubts about the actual intellectual capacity of the masses. And there are reasons for that. And we almost, we, it's, it's, it's easy to self mock our species as actually being incredibly stupid at times. And yet mass LBP, as you're about to hear, is based on one premise, which is that random ordinary people are actually capable of brilliant deliberation and output. It's not a thesis, it's not a random philosophy, it's not an academic idea, they do this. They do it every day. And so I'm so excited to have Peter with us. And why don't we just start, Peter, with you explaining, don't talk about yourself yet, because I actually want to dive into who you are and how you ended up running such a unique organization. Just for people who have no idea what Mass LBP is, and they've been getting all these emails from me being like, Mass LBP is the best. Peter, what the hell is Mass LBP? What do you do? Uh well, Mass is an organization that has a very cryptic name. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, I, I, I sometimes joke that if um, we named ourselves something more straightforward, like citizen strategies or something, that, that maybe we'd be better known and, and maybe more successful. But, you know, it was with great intention that we decided to have this really opaque identity because our work is about being an interlocutor, um, the middleman between government and citizens. And I think we all appreciate it. nobody likes the middleman. And so we wanted to blend <laughs> into the background as much as possible uh, because we try and help government put its best foot forward when it is serious. And believe it or not, it is sometimes quite serious about trying to involve people in a substantive way to solve uh, or at least get, get substantive input on really intractable issues. Um, then, then, then we try and, and help government put its best foot forward. And, and we also help citizens try and put their best foot forward and um, find some common ground around some of the issues that divide us. So, I mean, that's conceptually what it's about. The, the name mass, just to, to say, uh, sociologists in the crowd will appreciate, you know, the idea of a, a mass public that, you know, when we live in large communities, we don't know each other. And so those social relations break down. You need interlocutors, you need mediators. But uh, Thomas Paine, you know, the Anglo-American pamphleteer had this very evocative uh, uh, phrase in um, uh, one of his pamphlets that, that goes something like, there's a mass of sense 
that lies in a dormant state that good government should quietly harness. And to me, that encapsulates so much. Of course, you know, Canadian ears, you hear peace, order, and good government. That wasn't something that Payne knew anything about. But uh, it also isn't about citizens at the barricade or just crudely putting people in charge. It's about tapping into that dormant sense that I think resides amongst all of us and that only manifests when brought together. And if you're gonna have such a high-minded account of your name, God help you, you need a little whimsy. And that's the LBP part, which has been like confusing lawyers for 15 years uh, because LBP is not a limited liability partnership, it just stands for led by people. And you know, our work has been about trying to impanel citizens. The premise is that we all need to be um, or have the opportunity to really take on the responsibility of, of being representatives. We always talk, Mezzi and I can pick up on this thread, but you know, about, oh gosh, it must be so hard to be a politician, what a crappy job, except they keep doing it. They keep doing it, right? So there must be a reason why. And <laughs> you know, I'd like to afford that same opportunity to vastly more people, because I think if we had the responsibility to exercise public judgment, then we'd appreciate that. Sadly, there are fewer easy answers than any of us might like, um, but that it's actually much more possible to find common ground amongst ourselves than our current instantiation of politics would suggest. So we run what are called citizens assemblies. We randomly select people, we bring them together, and we do this on behalf of government clients, usually on issues that are not above the fold in the press, uh, to demonstrate that, that there is this dormant sense and extraordinary capability, and I think that'll be a big theme of our talk tonight, the capability of people to play this informed and very significant role. I, I guess the last motif I'd end on is, and I think it's a theme probably of, of, of much of this series, is that you know we're not at the end state of democracy. Let's be clear, like we're, we're, this is just the opening act. And uh, anyone who thinks that simply getting everyone the vote means that we have achieved the kind of full potential of a democratic society uh, hasn't really looked at who they are or who their neighbors are. Um, because I think a good deal more is possible. So let me get this straight. Clients, government clients, yes. pay you money to find ordinary random people who have no expertise in the field to provide them with rich feedback mm. to help guide their policy making. That would sound outrageous to many people. And, the, and, and what I'm most surprised about is that Anyone in government, I mean, to get into government, you have to have a bit of an ego and be a little elitist in the first place. Why would, why would anyone in government have faith in randomly selected people off the street? I mean, they could be crazy. Uh, some of us are, but most of us aren't, right? And unfortunately, a previous era of public opinion research, I think, has done an awful lot uh, to really color our view of this, what Walter Lippmann called a, a kind of phantom public. And his concern was simply that, you know, no one citizen could possibly, possibly be expected to keep on top of all of the goings on in society and, and have a kind of informed perspective of it. Um, and that's, that's probably true. I mean, goodness, you know, Mez, you pay a lot of attention to politics, but you know, if we do a 10 question quiz right now on current affairs, like none of us can keep it all in our heads, including in fact, our elected you know, officials. I have people all the time who are like, um, oh, the best way for democracy to work now is that we should all just have an app and we should all vote on everything. And I'm thinking, are you crazy? I don't want to have to learn about every issue. That sounds like a nightmare. I, I mean, I want to delegate to people who are informed and have the space to have thoughtful face-to-face -face discussions. I do not wanna be an expert on everything, nor, nor could I be. So, so here we are a couple of minutes in and we're already you know, pointing to a couple of things that this form of democracy, the current way we've organized ourselves, really exaggerate. And, and one is the idea that, um, that voting is the be all and end all in a democracy. And if we could just right. vote more on everything that it would be more democratic. And that's not at all the case. You know, to me, voting is actually the, the thing that, you know, ought to be the, in case of emergency, break glass. It's like, we've talked about, we've talked about, we've talked about it and we can't resolve it. So I guess we'll have to vote, right? But we should see voting often as an admission of failure 
not as a kind of preeminent democratic act. Now, of course, we, we need elections in order to, to sanction power in our society, but we've, we've taken that and just made it paramount. And, you know, I, I think we, we can look around the world and see all kinds of instances where you have legislatures that have actually tried to, to de-emphasize that kind of voting. Uh, we have some in Canada. I mean, the way that consensus-based government occurs in Nunavut to some degree, um, I think is quite significant, but we can look to other parliaments as well. In any event, the, the point is, uh, no, we don't need more majoritarian. We don't need more crude, technologically enabled, aggregative forms of direct democracy. What we need are opportunities for people to do the very basic and often very boring, tedious thing of sitting together. We need to sit together. We need to talk about stuff, and we need a chance to, you know, uh, not only represent. I think this is one of the preoccupations of our time, and importantly so, because too many guys like Meslin and myself have been the ones at the table, and so the emphasis is now bringing more people from more backgrounds with varied identities to the table, and so representation is really critical. But that doesn't deal with the other side of the democratic equation, which is about recognition about people actually feeling, not just being seen, but actually feeling heard. And you can go to parliament, you can go to a ballot box, but I don't think you're gonna walk away feeling heard. That's something that we can only afford to each other. And that's a very different kind of democratic practice. Okay, Peter, um, why wouldn't a government just hire a consulting firm to recruit a blue ribbon panel of experts. So we'll walk us through an actual topic, like something you've worked on recently. Uh, walk us through the numbers. How many, how many letters did you send out? What was the response yeah. rate? How many people did you gather in a room? And then how was that better than, let's say you gathered 20 people in a room in the end or 30. Why is that better than not just gathering 20 or 30 experts? What's the value add that an expert wouldn't already be able to provide? So, uh I'll take you through a very specific example, but first I, I want to kind of de-exoticize what we're all about because there's a tendency to, to be like, oh my God, the public, you bring them together and then they're all so reasonable, incredible. Uh, well, I mean, come on, that just shows you know, some of our, our latent biases more than anything. And what we're doing is actually trying to recover one of the oldest democratic conventions that actually predates the franchise. you know the coroner's jury the crown's jury uh, that was impaneled in order to do like understand wrongful death dates to like the 1200s um this has been the the idea of randomly selecting people to conduct investigation to provide advice to establish truth this is one of the bedrocks of any democratic society and it's because impartiality is as important as interests right disinterest is as important as interest in a democratic society so it's a mechanism we've long had we continue to run coroner's juries of course for wrongful death and you know that's a group of citizens in a non-adversarial courtroom uh, that that end up you know learning about what happened and trying to provide thoughtful recommendations to industry and society and government to prevent those things from happening again. And all we've tried to do, based on the experience of BC and Ontario and other jurisdictions that used citizens' assemblies is to try and make this part of our democratic culture. So let me give you an example that's underway right now. Um, I think quite reasonably, many Canadians uh, are concerned about um, how the, the use of social media is coarsening society, is is um, a, a source of polarization, is, is amplifying hate. Uh, sadly, over the last month in Canada, we've had a, a really opposite lesson in the power of social media to fuel conspiracies and again, polarize society. So the Department of Canadian Heritage, um, more than two years ago, commissioned the Public Policy Forum and the Max Bell Center at McGill and ourselves to run this process. Now, what's interesting, and I'll just, I'll focus less on social media and talk more about the process, is that it they, they did actually hire a blue ribbon panel and they hired a citizen's assembly. So right ah. now I've got this kind of funny through the, you know, um, I've got this funny experience where I am both facilitating a, a group of, of really esteemed, uh, terrific experts, you know, uh, Beverly McLaughlin, let me tell you, facilitating Beverly McLaughlin, there's there's a highlight for you. 
uh, as well as a number of like lawyers and tech experts and academics. And they're the Blue Ribbon Commission. And, and they are there to advise the government on its new online harms legislation and other measures. But on the other side, I've been chairing the citizens assemblies and there's one each year for three years, first dealing with online harms, then dealing with the prevalence of disinformation and a third topic next year. So I have a really interesting vantage point into how, you know, uh, um, you know, real expert um, uh, panelists grapple with these issues. And, and on the other hand, how our citizens are grappling with it. And you know, the funny thing is, um, obviously our experts are better informed. They can, they can cite case law, they can point to examples in other jurisdictions, but the way in which they talk with one another, the principles from which their, their reasoning are not dissimilar. And what's been really lovely about the process is that the citizens assembly is reporting publicly. It's reporting directly to the minister, but it's also reporting to the commission. And it's been very heartening to see the commissioners, as they do their work, tie things back to the Citizens' Assembly. So why do governments commission this? Well, I think it's an important source of democratic legitimacy. And that's particularly important in a time where we have a harder and harder time as a society agreeing amongst ourselves on what we think is legitimate. So this is a way to create consensus around contentious issues. I mean. Canada is a nice story about this, but we've got to look to countries like Ireland, where they managed to deal with the question of, you know, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage and, and affording women reproductive choice only because citizens' assemblies, only because a government impaneled citizens in order um, to deal with a, a kind of um, parliamentary impasse, to create an extra parliamentary mechanism to clear the delta between parliamentary opinion and public opinion, which was already a, a good deal further ahead. So why do governments do it? They do it not always because they're trying to be great innovators, not because they're you know, deeply committed, deliberative Democrats. They're doing it because they're between a rock and a hard place. They need to find a solution that people can live with. And I think as the OECD has demonstrated with 400 of these processes over the last decade, um, you know, this particular jury has has concluded that these juries have something quite valuable to offer. Amazing. So this started. This is it. Is it fair to say that this started in British Columbia in 04, or is that just kind of a mythology that Canadians like to throw around? Well, there's no question that the the largest um, and most sophisticated modern citizens assembly did, in fact, begin in British Columbia, and and it is only a two Canadian story that. You know, other jurisdictions around the world have been inspired by the experience of BC and Ontario. Um, since then, Mass has run 40 reference panels or citizens' assemblies uh, dealing with everything from digital identity to um, managing noise. If you fly into Pearson Airport at particular times of the day, the, the aircraft, the flight path, some of the, the different noise management features have been in part um, uh, uh, set by a group of randomly selected residents. Um, you know, the government's, you know, on again, off again commitment around pharmacare was largely influenced by a group of Canadians that were brought together and, and has helped to shape the Hoskins committee. So like there are lots of good, good case studies for this work. Um, but yes, BC and Ontario uh, were, um, were absolutely pivotal. Ireland happened because um, David Farrell, an academic from uh, from Ireland, an expert in single transferable vote, it's your language, Mez, uh, he came over to, to talk about how Ireland runs its electoral system and he got so inspired by the process, he went back and with his colleague Jane Souter said, hey, we need to, th this is the democratic innovation, forget electoral <laughs> reform for the moment, let's do this. And you know, now they're running like their 11th or 12th assembly and it's absolutely become part of the political mainstream. Um, has, has anyone um, found a way to make it more like built in institutionally rather than uh, having to, you know, contract out RFPs to, to firms like Mass, is, has, has uh, anyone actually created a d department of citizens assemblies where every bill has to go through some process like this. I, I'm not sure every bill ought to go through a process like <laughs> this, but, but you know, the OECD has coined this phrase and I think it's really helpful. It's called the deliberative wave. 
Okay. And anyone interested in following this movement online just needs to do hashtag DLib wave. Um, and of course, read the OECD report. You know, I, I think there are at least three tributaries in this wave. Uh, one is about dealing with the constitutional issues that countries have trouble advancing. And so in that in that wave, in that in that tributary, I would put um, what we've seen in, in Ireland. I, I, I would put maybe the French National Assembly on climate change. Major, major social issues that have needed some sort of extra parliamentary process to resolve. But then to your question, look, I mean, Belgium is a fascinating uh, case study right now in democratic innovations. Randomly selected citizens are joining elected parliamentarians on some of their parliamentary committees. Uh, in the wow. Ost-Belgian region, they have set up a permanent citizens assembly uh, that each year proposes three topics for subsequent citizens assemblies to take up. The mayor of Paris has just created, actually in part based on some of the work we did in Toronto several years ago in creating the Toronto Planning and Review Panel, has set up a permanent citizens assembly. Um, and Macron has made some, some commitments around potentially adapting the third chamber of the French parliament uh, to use citizens assemblies as well. So there's this, there's this tier, the, the second tributary is about parliamentary reforms. In Canada, what we've been focused on is, is the, the third tributary, it's about regulatory opportunities. And that's because I believe that as, as important as it is to address constitutional matters this way, as important as it is to reform our parliamentary institutions, the only platform we have that gives us scale, that gives every Canadian potentially the opportunity once or twice in their life to participate in a process like this, is if we use all of the workaday decisions that government has to make. And so that means that, in my mind, you know, infrastructure questions, wastewater questions, um, transit questions, you name it, are as important as an opportunity uh, to convene citizens. And it, it probably would take somewhere on the order of 100 of these a year. And with 10 provinces and as many major cities, it, that's not such a stretch. What what was the country you mentioned before Belgium that was putting people on committees, or is that Belgium? Oh, so so Belgium is is doing both. They have a permanent oh, citizens assembly, and they're randomly selecting people to serve on their parliamentary that, committees. That's amazing. Because like, I mean, one of my biggest questions is just how do we how do we scale this up? I mean, it's it's um, it would be great to by get arguing from go ahead by arguing from first principles. Okay, you know one of one of the 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 reasons why I think you you sort of frame this as, oh my goodness, you take random people and, and you put them at a table and they come up with clever stuff is because the latent assumption is that people are a risk. Right. Um, in, a, in a liberal democracy, you know, we've been very grudging with the vote. It's taken us the better part of 400 years just to get 80% of the population voting. Right. Right. And as recently as the 90s in Canada, you know, we, we still, you know, we're uh, enfranchising people and we still have enfranchised children, right? So, th so that project is not done and all of the gerrymandering we see taking place in the US, the, the blatant attempts to disenfranchise people shows that just holding the vote takes a tremendous amount of social energy. And why do we do this? Well, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but there's, there's another paradigm here where we don't see the public as a risk to be managed, but we actually see them as a resource to be harnessed. And, you know, the, 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 the risk uh, paradigm is, is kind of self-fulfilling. It's, it, it's the sort of thing where if you treat people badly, if you give them, you know, so little information, so little opportunity to influence things that impact them, if your consultations are so superficial, then of course, when people come out, in a poorly designed interaction, then they're going to sound off, they're going to be angry, it's going to be divisive, and politicians and public servants are just going to recoil all the more. And, and so they're going to be more controlling, they're going to afford fewer opportunities still. And so you just, you just create this dynamic that I think is very, very counterproductive. On the resource side of equation, you know, you, you, you just, you start from a different premise. Um, and the premise that we use at Mass is that you know, anybody who participates in our processes 
We treat them as though they're an elected representative with a fairly solemn duty. We staff them accordingly. And we, we, um, we're really asking them to perform a, a very important public role. And what's so striking is to see people rise to the occasion, to, to take on that, that, that representative burden, uh, which I think is actually one that ought to be part of our kind of civic repertoire. You know, democracy is, is fundamentally about managing conflict. It's about tapping into human ingenuity. Um, but it's also about an active empathic imagination. It's how we put ourselves in each other's shoes. We actually have to use our voice as proxies for others because we can never get everybody in the in the same room. And and that means that that you know the, the, there's something quite interesting that that has to occur with our ego and our identity. It, it means that we do have to have conversations about like what's in the interest of all. What what is the common good? Where is that to be found? Um, but that's never what's asked of us. Back to your point, it's like, okay, what's what serves my interest, and now let's tally up the interests, and and the winner will take all. So I, 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 th I think it's it's hard to get from here to there. It's hard to get from this risk uh, paradigm to a resource paradigm. But I actually think that's what democracy's kind of evolution is about, uh, and that those societies, many of them, the Nordics, I'll, I'll be blunt about it. I, I think they've, they've started to make that democratic transition and it's going to serve them very well. Um, Peter, we have a few questions about the methodology being used for the random selection. How do you know what the right, the right size group is? What efforts do you make to ensure that it's representative of the population? Obviously, you're sure. not just randomly throwing darts. There's a bit of methodology here. How does, how do, how does that scientific part work on your end? Right. So, I mean, let me just um, quickly say that that these processes, although they're popularly understood as like, let's hear from citizens, they're really citizen expert dialogues. And I actually think instead of talking about engagement or even democracy, talking about learning is is more helpful. It's the appropriate mode to understand these because these are these are learning processes, in which government is learning, citizens are learning, experts are learning. And all of this learning is occurring through dialogue. But how do people get in the room? We run what's called a civic lottery. Formally, this is known as sortition. And, um, you know, in, in the language of polling, it's a, a ra random stratified sample. Um, you can understand why I call it a civic lottery, because I want people to feel good about winning. And look, one of the most heartening days at Mass is when we call people up and we say, congratulations, you've won like four Saturdays of your life to talk about this this regulatory issue. and. And the really beautiful thing is people actually act like, oh my God, like one of the 649, like it's, it is a, it's a milestone uh, in many people's lives. And it's not just because they're all the kind of unlock democracy keeners. It's not just because they'd dial into a night like tonight. The, the, the sort of range of motivations for people is, is one of the things that makes these processes so rich. You know, somebody's like, well, I volunteered for this thing about healthcare because, you know, my mom had a bad experience and I want to make sure it never happens again. Fair dues. Someone else says, well, I've just come to the country and I thought this was a way to like give something back. Somebody else was like, you know, my, uh, my uncle, um, was a doc and, you know, I never knew him that well. I thought this might be a better way to sort of understand like very human instincts come out but but generally people are looking for a way to connect you know, people I, I i i've run you know uh these processes with i i don't know almost 1700 canadians at this point one in 40 households or so have received one of these letters and and every conceivable background and walk of life and and yet what i see is the extent to which we're the same people want purpose people want belonging um people want a way to connect with each other and, and that's actually why they do it. It's not because they're trying to like run the room and jam an issue. They, they, they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And this will be the best and for many people only opportunity they'll have in their lives to, to, to what you sometimes talk about is touching the state, right? Which for most people is, is such a, um, a distant, um, and, and, and not altogether benign uh, force, right? So we send out these letters, it's not complicated. 
We send out letters to randomly selected households. We work with Canada Post. We do a random walk. Um, 10,000 letters go out. And, you know, about 5 to 7% of people volunteer, which is a lot. If you know anything about direct mail, like if you send out, like, offering people money, you know, you might get 1% response. But, like, we get at least 5% of people responding. I always say, well, how many people want to volunteer? But one of those four Saturdays, they had a commitment or they just started a new job or they had a young kid. And and then, you know, we, we know what the demographics are of the community we're purporting to represent. And then we randomly select attributes, typically age, gender, geography. Um, sometimes we control uh, for a, a proxy income measure like housing. We don't need to generally ask income, ethnicity, or education. It comes out in the wash. Um, and you know, we, we can have extended conversations about representation and equity. Uh, you know, I, one thing I, I can be sure of is that we, we vastly exceed the diversity that's to be found in our legislatures and um, uh, councils. And, you know, that's a pretty low bar. <laughs> but our experience is that if if you walk into any of these assemblies and you spend an afternoon with people, you're going to find that, yep, that that feels like that feels like society. That that feels like community. Uh, we're not trying to run social science a, a social science experiment here, though. We're 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 you know this is this is a this is a production of community, um, and. Uh, you know, we we go way out of our way to to remove as many barriers as we can imagine to to make it um, as accessible as as possible. And I've been very interested in the kind of equity impacts. But now with that that sample size of you know forty lotteries and all, all these households, we've got a pretty good sense that you know people who who people who have their spouse sign them up for this process to get them out of the house. They're going to be okay. Um, we're we're going to take all comers and do what we can. Um, we've got 20 minutes left, and I still have a bunch of questions. So let's just do a quick, rapid question. I'll be faster. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. I love hearing you talk, but I want to I want to make sure we get through these. This is a lightning question. Uh, there's been some good questions in the comments about logistics around inclusion. One was about people who might not be literate, or yeah. our perhaps English isn't their first language. And then someone else pointed out, um, for those who couldn't afford to take four days off, you know, is there any income supplement or do you pay these folks? Um, so yeah, um, accessibility in terms of literacy, like that they can actually open this and read it. Uh, and number two, people who just could, you know, are working two or three jobs and can't afford yeah. to give up a weekend. Totally. Um... I mean, generally in our processes, there is a um, a needs based honorarium, and you know, this is on this is unfortunately where there's a kind of there's a a cultural preference that 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 we've discerned. In Germany, for instance, it's it's simply understood that you will get paid, um, and uh, there's actually a, a a law that enables that payment to occur. Um, unfortunately, you know, Canada is is um, a, a bit retrograde here and I, I think if we were to say everybody gets two hundred dollars a day then well we unfortunately we know from the experience of the Ontario Citizens Assembly that the, that the that elements of the media um, will use that to delegitimize the process they'll say well people it's just folks who've got nothing better to do than to kind of claim their per diem and you know it's a longer conversation but a lot of the um, measures that we've taken have been to defend these processes against the kind of critique that occurred in Ontario, uh, which to, to any of the, the real geeks on this stuff out there, they'll appreciate that how it was received in BC and Ontario was quite different. Uh, but we provide elder care, we provide daycare, we'll, you know, we'll, you know um, any kind of accessibility measure in addition to that as needed uh, per diem. Uh, will undertake um, language is a, is a, is an issue. There, there's no question. We can operate in both official languages, uh, but going beyond that is 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 harder. Just as it would be for any elected representative who, for whom one of those languages 
you know, wasn't a working language and, and they were trying to sit in council or a legislature. Peter, can you describe the education process a bit? We have a question from Katie about this. Obviously, you don't throw these folks right into deliberation. How does how do yeah. you get them up to a speed where they actually know what they're talking about? Uh, well, um, so, I mean, this is where I said, the, the I think the better way to un understand these processes is through the mode of, of learning and as a citizen expert dialogue. So we, we do think a bit like adult educators and, you know, to be an adult educator, you're not, you're, 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 you're not teaching to the test. You're, you're kind of supporting, you're meeting someone where they're at, you're interested in what their kind of learning goals are. You support them to kind of, you know, um, find and our their voice and articulate themselves so you know we we develop a curriculum for each of these processes and it kind of starts like okay well, what would a reasonably informed person need to know and how do you start from the basics without it becoming incredibly tedious and time consuming and depending on the topic we, we've got you know some some ways of doing that um and, and you know this is where again i think a lot of the the sort of um, I don't know, the, the orthodoxies of our time aren't helpful, this idea that we've got to write everything at a grade four or five level, you know, it, in fact, people, people do read, they read a ton of material, that's, we're reading on our phones almost all the time, <laughs> we're just reading like little capsules, and it's a bit sensationalist and everything, but fine, like people are really good at absorbing information, and what we try and do is provide heuristics to people, so that they can then infer, you know, make make thoughtful inferences. Of course, we have to keep our fingers off the scale. You know, we we often have oversight committees that vet the the the, the speakers who um, come to the the assembly or the reference panel. Ultimately, our design choices are based on on ensuring the legitimacy of the process, and so we're not going to make a design choice that immediately, um, you know, leaves the whole process. Uh, open to criticism, um, but you no, know, we 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 try and take a lot of care in uh, thinking about curriculum um, and uh, and seeing that like a wide range of views are are represented. But a lot of this is like I, I'm I'm only trying to deal with the reasonable person test. I'm not I'm not trying to deal with you know the the critical theorist who wants to kind of take this to the nth degree. I'm like, okay, what would the woman or man on the street say it was reasonable? It's like, okay, you brought together how many people and they had how much time and they heard from how many folks and they wrote it themselves. And what did they conclude? Like, if we could be like, this is, you know, um, I guess in the language of um, uh, uh, psychotherapy, you know, they, 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 they talk about good enough, right? We, we need the, the good enough process, just like we need the good enough parent. We need, we need it to be good enough that we can accept this. It doesn't need to be perfect. Um, okay, I have two, two more questions. Um, well, I have a bunch, but I have two I really want to fit in. So you guys, I don't know who made it, but there was a great poster that came out of the Ontario Citizens Assembly with with dots on it. I have, oh. a, I have one in my home. And essentially it shows the demographic breakdown of the provincial legislature in terms of who, how many are tenants, how many are women, how many are black or indigenous or this or that. And of course the numbers are not reflective of society. Actually, there might've been three categories. It was one society, one the legislature, one the assembly. I don't remember, but it was contrasting we, the diversity of the assembly to the legislature. We right. might have made that poster at mass. <laughs> I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a gorgeous, I mean, you guys make there beautiful things. Aside from what you what you do, and your your work is intellectually beautiful, but your the products you make are also gorgeous, um, including that poster. But so I really like the idea that these um, assemblies or panels are more diverse than our legislatures. But one element of that diversity that's probably overlooked or much harder to measure is introversion and just communication style. By nature, any election is gonna elect a bunch of overly confident, slightly arrogant extroverts. I mean, that's who runs for office. 
Um, and once they all get into a council chambers and they get into a legislature, they're all very eager to talk and be heard. You're randomly selecting people, many of which in the end might be kind of more introverted. Um, that's the coolest part of your project to me. What happens when introverts are part of um, decision-making? And I'm just wondering, is it hard to get those people to speak? It's one thing for them to say, okay, I'm gonna try this and show up. But unlike Toronto City Council or Queens Park, where the hard part is getting them to shut up, how do you deal with a room full of folks where two or three might be really shy and not have the experience of speaking out and being confident of their own voice. Uh, I, that's a really interesting framing um, of extroversion and introversion. I'd, I'd probably need to think more about it. You know, I think it still takes a measure of confidence to to volunteer to to put your name forward. Um, it often feels on the on the first day of an assembly, it feels like the first day of school. Right. Uh, people show up a little bit early. People wear slightly nicer clothes uh, <laughs> and they walk into the space like sussing everybody out. You know, and the important thing is to, to try and put people at ease as, as, as quickly as possible. Um, and I, I have this, this kind of spiel that I do often at the start of an assembly where I, I thank people profoundly and, and sincerely for the fact that, you know, they've worked a full week. They, they want to be with their kids and here they're talking about auto insurance or whatever it might be like that's it, it's a it's a really important gesture of, of civic commitment um, and then I, I pause and I say but I don't actually care what you think and everybody's like kind of like braces and you hear the in the room and you're like what do you, what do you mean and I, I I love this moment it's 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 the only kind of conspicuous bit of kind of showmanship around the 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 assembly um but it makes a very very important point i say my problem is that i've got to chair this thing and and there are 36 of you or there are 42 of you or however many but i had like 600 people who want to be sitting at your chair this morning and i had to tell them no right and you know you you have a really important job you you have to you know do well by them and then do well by everyone we can see when we look the window onto the street do well by everyone who got a letter and do every do well by everyone else and you know the funny thing is that the room always gets a little bit like quiet then and then people sit up a little bit like there's just this kind of like like this this in engage i don't like this word but this kind of engagement with the with the thing but it's it's almost like a little like switch flips in people's mind and and now it's okay we're 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 here to think about this ephemeral public so i i don't know whether they're do we have to work very hard to get people to speak look you've got four saturdays the the kind of substructure the the mechanics of a citizens assembly are super iterative so people have a chance to practice they practice with low barrier conversations then they they practice with more and more you know charged issues but that i mean mez you'd appreciate this as someone who designs a lot of processes yourself so we have it backwards you know we think that the way to to bring people together to talk about anything and say let's have a brainstorm what are your best ideas for solving this problem the right. terrible way to start any conversation <laughs> you start by saying who are you right and what do you care about and what can we agree that we care about now what can we agree that concerns us now which amongst those things is most important to us now what have we heard are some answers or, or potential solutions to the things that most concern us and how can we then make those potential solutions work for everyone it's a it's a totally different you know way of just group processing a challenge and that that's almost separate and apart from the democratic um thrust of the whole ex exercise right katie says sounds like you're she's got it food. right yeah it sounds brilliant she's got it right you're yeah. gonna steal that now and put it on your website sounds great very well, this, very this well written it. yeah I mean, Daniel Yankelevich, for anyone interested, wrote a beautiful book called Coming to Public Judgment. And he was a great American pollster who, you know, had his epiphany that public opinion isn't what we need more of. We've got lots of opinion. What we need is judgment. And we need ways of exercising and manufacturing good judgment in a democratic society. Um, we've had a few 
a few questions in in the in the chat um, that relates back to something Duff Conacher said uh, at his session a few weeks ago. Um, mm. The topic of assemblies came up, and he. he he likes them very much, but he said he prefers a model. I think it was Sweden, but essentially there's more of them and smaller. So it's a more decentralized, I think they were called study groups. And what he liked about them was that it decreases the chances of one persuasive or charismatic person within a panel or assembly kind of swaying everyone. Do you, do, do you find that there's a risk of that? And are there models you're looking at that have more assemblies that are smaller rather than putting all your eggs in one basket? I think our challenge is right now is assemblies are starting to enjoy this little moment. And I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm sad to say that 2022 and beyond, you know, my sort of it trend is democracy promotion. And, and this is going to get swept up in, in this moment. Um, is that is that people are going to have a lot of assumptions about what assembly isn't and, and without seeing one and we need to find ways for people to have a direct experience of, of these assemblies um uh so that you know those those perspectives are well informed Look, i don't want to take anything away from from sweden and, and germany has its tradition of planning cells there are lots of versions of this i mean let's not be dogmatic about citizens assemblies i i, I don't give it anything about like what it's called or, or how it works or, you know like the bottom line is like what percentage what percentage of the population at some point in their lives gets to touch the state gets to advise government in a serious way gets to make decisions that it's their lives that that to me is an important measure of ultimately democratic fitness in our society and it's one that pays the democratic dividend to our society. So if we need to do it through, you know, study groups in Sweden or planning cells in Germany or assemblies in Ireland or reference panels in Canada, I don't care. Democracy's second act is to deal with the same ratio problem that we had in the first act, which is, okay, what percentage of the population gets to exercise the vote? And roughly what's the ratio between electeds and voters? And and now we need to we need to pick up that same that same job. What and this doesn't solve everything in a democracy, my goodness. And we absolutely have to hold the line on all of this kind of like voting stuff. Don't don't get me wrong. Well, we may have exaggerated, it's absolutely essential that we, we hold that line. But we have to go beyond it simultaneously. And we have to think about okay, how do we tap into the immense, immense capability of our public? I mean you know, one of the things that, that sort of driven me bonkers during the pandemic here is that, you know, we had this amazing example um, just just a few years before in 2015. Government of Canada facing the Syrian refugee crisis decided that it was going to really, you know, invest in our, our longstanding tradition of private refugee sponsorship. It put out the call to Canadians. You know, this is this is a real dollars adopt a family for one or more years, get them settled, get the best start of life in Canada. And Canadians, you know, the, John McCallum, it's forgotten, but at the time said, my biggest problem is I can't find enough refugees. I mean, this was unique amongst G7 countries. So, so they're happy to do and they're happy to do it. And during the said, we did it for about 72 hours. 50,000 Canadians here with contact trace the Fed figure out. So we just looked at the dormant capability untapped. I think lost the ability to mobilize people. In your, your, your audio is breaking up a bit, just so you know. Oh. Tell all, the kids, tell all the kids in the house to stop streaming their video games. Um, um, okay, we have four minutes left. First of all, people are still joining, which is hilarious. Um, thanks. There you go. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, hear you good now. Um, someone, someone asked. I think it was. I think it was Kate. Um, what is your success rate of getting governments to listen to the recommendations that come from the panels? Uh, it's a good question. Um, there have been a lot of recommendations over the years. 
I, I think it's probably somewhere around two thirds, which interestingly is the, the same ratio that the deputy coroner of Ontario uh, said he had with, with his juries. And I think that's right. You know, there's been a lot of uh, controversy about the French Climate Assembly and why didn't Macron do everything that the assembly said. At the end of the day, we, we do have electeds and they are the deciders. And I don't think it's uh, always right and appropriate that assemblies, they get to make the call. Um, but even if we put in very Canadian context, we have these things called royal commissions. Um, they, they take you know a detailed look at complex issues that provide advice to government, their batting average, so-so. Some of our most important social legislation um, has come off the back of royal commissions and others have been shelved. Well, you know, we, we've got to expect that assemblies will have a similar track record. Uh, but I think what's important is, again, that we're turning to citizens uh, in order to provide that advice and, and that we're then building the substructure to ensure ultimately that this becomes a popular experience of living in a democracy, not an exceptional one. Peter, we talked earlier about scaling up. What about scaling down? Um, I can think of so many examples where where random selection could replace traditional elections on a small scale. For example, a condo board could be randomly selected. Um, school trustees could be randomly selected from parents. Unions could randomly select leadership rather than again, the most overly confident, you know, loud mouths always ending up in positions of power. Can you think of examples you've heard of or that you've, or that you've thought of where the mass model could be used in our own daily lives, in our workplaces, in our schools, community groups, residents associations. How do we move away from just traditional elections towards this idea that random ordinary people have so much to contribute when the space is provided? Um, I mean, look, uh, one of the problems here is schools. Right. We teach all the wrong lessons about democracy, I think, at schools. And if I could do like one single intervention, it would be to disband every uh, elected student body, uh, perhaps tomorrow. And I would I would sit down with vice principals and principals and I'd say, what are the 20 most important decisions that you make in a year? And I would create curriculum around many of those decisions. And I'd randomly select students in with staff and teachers uh, to sit together and to make some of those decisions. Um, because, you know, we learn, unfortunately, at a very tender age that actually, you know, the cool kids, the popular kids, the irreverent kids, they're the ones who, who will step forward, the extroverts amongst us. Uh, and our job is relatively passive. You know, we, we get to sit on the couch, we get to comment, we get to laugh, we get to cheer, we get to, you know, be a spectator to it. And um, I, I think that primes us in all the wrong ways. I would do that and I would also stop teaching Lord of the Flies, which is an absolutely horrific book uh, for tender minds. It tells us all the wrong things about what will happen to you in a, in a state of nature. So, you know, and, and is also contrary to what we know uh, happened, but that's actually a, a digression. Peter, on a on a personal note, um, tell us a bit about how you got to where you are and what it's like running mass, um, selecting your 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 team, running a team, um, being the name and the face who's often, you know, the spokesperson for this growing movement. Like just just, just from a personal point of view, yeah, um, just reflect on being Peter McLeod and uh, what it's been like. I mean, you, you, you went into this, there's no precedent. You didn't go into mass being like, oh, I'm gonna run one of those citizen assembly groups everyone's running. Like you went into this blind and then here we are many years later, just like, how are you feeling? And when you reflect back on that journey, how, how are you feeling on a personal level? Well, it's striking. Next year will be our 15th anniversary. Um, and I always said to, um, to friends and colleagues that, that this was, you know, a 10 to 20 year project. Uh, and the project was about making this part of Canada's democratic culture, not because I thought it was a solution to anything, but just 
because I thought uh, it embodied a set of, of values that could be quite constructive. Um, and mass, I mean, yes, it's a, a company, but that's just an expedient vehicle. Uh, mass has always been a been a disposable um, uh, entity, and in, in a sense, it's kind of like a booster rocket that ought to fall away in pursuit of uh, a different mission. Because obviously, you know, the, the the vision here can't be achieved by just a larger and larger mass. I mean, that would be absurd, and nobody's going to franchise this. And let me assure you, the profit margins suck. Uh, and importantly so, because at the end of the day, I'm standing with, with my fellow citizens. And if I'm driving a fancy car and have a fancy house and all the rest of this, then then our relation is going to be different. So, no, Mass mass has been a vehicle. How, do, how does it feel? I mean, look, I, I, um, I'm incredibly heartened by, by this deliberative wave. Um, I, that didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and, you know, we're, we're at this, this real moment, uh, I think for, uh, democratic societies where, you know, we've, we've, um, we've, we've, we've really been quite complacent. Um, and, and now we're going to have to get inventive. Um, and we're going to have to get serious because there's no question we're being tested. Um, I read an op-ed recently that, you know, said that um, so for societies to succeed, they, they actually need to be able to um, remain resilient in the face of a lot of different uh, economic, climactic, social pressures. And and mitigating those pressures and tensions is is going to be what separates successful societies from failed societies. Um, the only way you're resilient is when you find a way to like pull people together. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think the work that we've been doing around assemblies is um, important, but it, it's, it's nowhere close to e being equal to the task. It's, it's why Richard, who's on this call, um, he and I have been, have been trying to work on a book that articulates a little bit about this and, and how the larger the larger challenge is actually how we view the public. And um, so long as we treat publics as risks rather than resources, then we're incapacitating ourselves. We won't be able to meet the challenge of these times. So, so how does it feel? Um, it, it you know, in, in a very narrow way, it feels good to see the extent to which this stuff has has kind of caught on in other jurisdictions. It'll be famously Canadian that only when we see the Europeans doing it will we, you know, really feel like we have to catch up and we'll do more of it ourselves. But I also think there's there's so much more work to be done, um, so that that people, you know, to my earlier point, do feel do feel recognized that there is a measure of of agency, of efficacy, of, of personal voice. Um, but it's also really exciting. It's really exciting because we, we, haven't, we haven't designed half of the kind of mechanisms, the half of the norms that we need uh, to live well and to live freely. Um, Peter's offered to give us a few more minutes. We've got him till, till 10 after. Um, tell us a little bit more about the book. And also, I want to ask, I mean, the word misinformation is being thrown around a lot right now. There's, there's a fear that we've never been more collectively misinformed and that everyone's being exposed to lies. Um, does that make your work harder in the sense that many of us are being convinced daily that we're collectively becoming stupider? Or are you actually providing the antidote? Are you, you know, in a way, mass is saying, yeah, if you mean, if you're just listening to social media and not actually getting out there and having slow, deliberative discussions with people, you will end up stupid. <laughs> We're the answer to that. Or do you think it erodes, does it erode your thesis, the fact that there's people marching in the streets against science? Uh, um uh, mass is not a solution to anything and citizens assemble. I mean, we've never been solutionists about this. I don't, I don't think um you know this is this is a one shot 
a problem. Um, and I think it, it, it reminds us that actually we're off by many, 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 many orders of magnitude about actually what needs to be invested and ex invested quite explicitly in, um, in shoring up the sort of, um, foundations of our democratic society. Uh, we do a lot on autopilot. We don't do it with it explicitly. We don't do it with intention. Um, we don't have measures of democratic fitness in our society. We all we have is you know the seismograph telling us as to whether we support or don't support uh, whoever happens to be the party in power. Um, a, a democratic society is is one that I think takes much more seriously um, the 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 sort of democratic health of itself as a whole, but also of 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 individual citizens. Um, so we're not we're not there yet and. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, I think this question about misinformation, Canada is interesting in this respect. Um, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, we recognize that unless we put some significant protections around public airwaves, uh, we would be inundated by um, Americans who, who had a, a different kind of vantage point on, on society and, and, and besides that, Canadians themselves, just as a, a matter of sovereignty, ought to be able to have the cultural space in order to explore their own imaginations. We've been running with social media this absolutely uncontrolled social experiment. Um, the right of free expression is not equal to the right of free amplification. And we don't even understand how um, these platforms work, much less why they amplify the messages that they do. And so, you know, sadly, like we've, we've been, data Scotch Paul is great on this. Like we, we've kicked the legs out from under the democratic table, all of the kind of norm forming um, ways in which society can coalesce around shared experiences, we lose. And, and then we've taken technology um, that has absorbed all of us. And we have, a, we have allowed it to create a digital public sphere that is quite hostile uh, to any of us being able to find common ground with people who don't share our views. I, I think this is an incredibly dangerous experiment. <laughs> of course, I'm not alone in thinking that. And how does mass, how does mass relate to that? Well, uh, mass doesn't relate to that. I mean, look, our, our, our booster rockets are like pointed in, in a single trajectory here. We're, we're trying to, to do that work. Yes, you know, we've been running the assemblies on democratic expression regulating social media and heartened to see, you know, that in two years now, the Canadians have put forward, I think, some very thoughtful recommendations that would change the power balance between the platforms and, and citizens. Uh, but I think, you know, the, I've been struck as all of the participants have been struck that when we kind of learn the history of Canada's inaction in this regulatory space, that we've just seeded the ground. So, like, the people are perplexed. They're like, what? What, we don't have rules about this? What, we can't hold these companies to account? Things that we let broadcasters and publishers, uh, things that we would never let broadcasters and publishers get away with, we, we've kind of given a free reign to the Facebooks and Twitters and Googles of this world. And, and I think we're all now coming to terms with the impact of that. But misinformation is just at its, like, very early stages here. Like this is this is just the the warm up act for stuff that gets much much weirder, and um, that's why I think it's incumbent on us to um, to get very serious uh, about thinking beyond the very thin. I mean, Ben Barber's phrase, very thin democracy that we have today, and figure out how we can thicken it urgently. Um. Peter, thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Thank you to all of you for sticking with us. Um, I always like to see that the number we start with is the same that we ended with and it actually somehow went up today. Um, and um, I am gonna send an email in the next few days with links and resources to all the things we discussed. When Peter's book comes out, you'll all be hearing about it through my email list and we'll have Peter back for some kind of launch event or whatever, we'll, we'll definitely want to tune into that. What's your timeline there, Peter? Well, it, it's not my book. It's my book and Richard's book. Richard, and, Richard, um, what's the timeline? 
Um, the time, I think the timeline is uh, uh, hopefully finish it by the end of this year and it'll be out in hopefully early 2023. Um, plugging along well so far. And I, I just want to say it's uh, it's not just a book about our ideas, far from it. Um, we're actually having a great time interviewing and chatting with a lot of other people all over the world. So it's going to be a book about their ideas, not just ours. Um, and we'll definitely keep you posted. Thanks so much, Dave. Wow, amazing. Thank you, Richard. Um, everyone, just want to remind you, we're called Unlock Democracy Canada. We're a nonprofit board members here on the call. And our work is also made possible by monthly donors who support us through Patreon. I'll send you a link about that too. You can give 10 bucks a month or five bucks a month or $1 a month, whatever you want. But um, that's how we're able to organize these sessions and do the work we do around voting reform and different types of democratic innovations so we can all live, live in a better world. Um, everyone who's on the call from Mass, um, Sarah or anyone else, thank you for all of your work. And um, yeah, that's it. Hope you have a great evening. Have a great family day. And this is just episode four or five, I forget, of a series that's going all year. So check out our website for all the amazing upcoming events we have. Hope to see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Take care.